Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 12 part 1D. This is anaerobic respiration. Now previously we learned about aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is the breakdown of biomolecules in order to synthesize energy in the form of ATP. In the presence of oxygen, anaerobic respiration is the synthesis of ATP in the absence of oxygen. So what happens in the absence of oxygen? Aerobic respiration cannot occur. Why? Because oxygen is the final electron and hydrogen acceptor in the process called oxidative phosphorylation. This is stage 4 of aerobic respiration. If you don't remember it, pause this video and go and watch the previous video so that you get a better idea. Anyways, if oxygen is not available as a final electron, electron and hydrogen acceptor then the electron transport chain stops okay one stop everything stops the hydrogen from the reduced NAD and FAD cannot be removed there is no ATP form from oxidative phosphorylation so there can't be ATP form now it doesn't stop there that's not the extent of the damage right because reduced NAD and FAD cannot become oxidized or in other words, NAD and FAD are not regenerated, it remains as NADH and FADH2. This means that there is no NAD and FAD for the Krebs cycle and the link reaction, so they will stop too. Now, however, okay, however, glycolysis can still occur. How strange is that? But glycolysis can still occur it is in the cytoplasm. It makes a net 2 ATP per glucose molecule. Previously, in aerobic respiration, we can make 32 ATP per glucose molecule. But now, we can only make 2 ATP per glucose molecule. It's not much, but at least it's something, right? Anyways, um, glycolysis, remember glycolysis? It is a breakdown of glucose. And the final product is pyruvate. So, substrate sorry so the glucose is not completely broken down without oxygen it's not completely broken down it, the final product is just pyruvate and pyruvate still contains energy and that cannot be used okay that cannot be pyruvate cannot be fully oxidized without link reaction and Krebs cycle but don't you forget two NADH are formed too and you might be asking why doesn't glycolysis stop as well? What keeps glycolysis going? Now, there are some special features. There are some special pathways used to regenerate NAD that we learned in a while. But bear in mind that these um, two different pathways right, are not sustainable and cannot go on indefinitely because of its toxic byproducts. What are the special pathways? These are the special pathways. There are two of them occurring in different places so the first one are in yeast cell or plant tissues this pathway is called ethanol pathway or alcoholic fermentation it's this pathway in yeast that helps us produce beer understand okay so yeast alcohol think yeast cells alcoholic fermentation the second one here is animals in animals, in mammalian muscles, in your muscles, and you know that feeling where your muscle is starting to feel, um, I want to say sour, but I mean sore, right? This uh, pathway occurs in there, and it's called lactate pathway, or lactic fermentation. Sometimes it's called lactic acid pathway as well. Now this especially occurs when muscle activity is high and cells do not have oxygen to perform aerobic respiration. So when probably you are exercising. Now again, I just want to highlight to you that these pathways are the special pathways used to regenerate NAD. It is to keep glycolysis going. But again, this is not sustainable and cannot go on indefinitely due to its toxic byproducts. What toxic byproducts we say, we will find out soon. Okay, let's start with anaerobic respiration yeast, which is using the ethanol pathway. The ethanol pathway, um, as an introduction, is a two-step reaction. 
you are going to be converting pyruvate, which is the final product of glycolysis, to ethanol, and then from ethanol to ethanol. Can you remember that? Pyruvate, ethanol, ethanol. Two steps. This process is irreversible. Okay, so it cannot be converted back. Ethanol cannot be converted back to ethanol, cannot be converted back to pyruvate. So let's look at this process in detail, shall we? So think, yeast, glycolysis is still happening. So glyco glycolysis produces pyruvate. So there are a series of reactions here. What are the products? There is a net gain of 2 ATP, which is seen here. And there is also a gain of 2 NADH or reduced NAD. So NAD here becomes NADH. So NAD plus N plus 2H here becomes NADH. You can see that all the numbers here are doubled up because there are two molecules. 2 hydrogen, 2 NADH, 2 NAD. Yeah. Anyways, now we have two pyruvates here and actually each of these pyruvate molecules goes through decarboxylation and you know what happens during decarboxylation. Carbon dioxide is produced. And then it's converted to ethanol. So each pyruvate, okay, each pyruvate molecule, one carbon is removed. So if there's two pyruvate molecules, two molecules of carbon dioxide is produced. And you get two ethanol molecules here. What's the third step? The third step is when ethanol acts as the hydrogen acceptor. Don't forget the aim. The aim is to regenerate NAD, right? So now we have NADH here. NADH is going to give its hydrogen to ethanol, forming ethanol. So this helps the NAD be regenerated. This process here is catalyzed by alcohol dehydrogenase, which is in purple here, very pretty purple. I love purple. Anyways, alcohol dehydrogenase, well, it should be easy to remember because this is the ethanol pathway. It has to do with alcohol and it's yeast. Wonderful. And it's removing two hydrogens from NADH, therefore the name dehydrogenase. This also prevents the H plus from lowering pH in yeast cell. So if these two hydrogen atoms were to freely float around the yeast cell, it's going to make the yeast cell more acidic and this will cause over time its enzymes to change in shape. And we don't want that. So the, the ethanol receives that hydrogen and becomes ethanol. And of course, NAD is regenerated as a result. Ta -da! And this will allow glycolysis to continue, so you can continue to have glycolysis for a while to produce 2 ATP per glycos glucose molecule. It's not a lot, but at least it's something, right? Now, but there's a catch. Remember I said that this reaction cannot go on indefinitely, and that's because ethanol is toxic and the reaction is irreversible. So whatever, um, whatever remaining chemical potential energy in the ethanol, okay, there's two carbons, is not completely oxidized, that is wasted, and uh, over time the yeast is going to die in the alcohol. That's why when you drink alcohol, when you buy alcohol in bottles, it doesn't get more alcoholic over time. The yeast has died. Yeah. See? Anyways. Moving on to lactate pathway. This is in mammals. We're not talking about yeast or alcohol or beer anymore. We are talking about lactate pathway, lactic fermentation. This occurs in mammals and this occurs in you. It is a one step reaction, pyruvate to lactate. So just now it was pyruvate to ethanol to ethanol. This is pyruvate to lactate, hence the lactate pathway. It should be quite easy to remember. This is, however, reversible. Let's look at the details. Number one, glycolysis occurs and obviously it produces pyruvate. So what are the, what are the uh, products here? 2 ATP and again, 
two N A D H. So H plus N A D N A D H. Great. This is interesting because in this pathway, pyruvate acts as a hydrogen acceptor and receives that hydrogens from NADH. Combining with the hydrogen, the pyruvate becomes lactate or lactic acid. This reaction here is catalyzed by lactate dehydrogenase and as a result, NAD is regenerated. Ta-da! It is really easy, right? Ta-da! NAD. And this allows glycolysis to continue. So you can continue to produce 2 ATP per glucose molecule, quite a sad amount. Um, but at least it's something. Remember that this pathway cannot go on indefinitely because lactate is toxic. It is lactic acid. It's an acid. It causes a drop in pH. And that is not good for your body. It needs to be at a certain optimal pH for your enzymes to be functioning optimally. But the hope is that the reaction is reversible. So what happens to lactate after you stop exercising and stretching your muscles? So your lactate will be transported by blood plasma from the muscles to be broken down in the liver. Now in the liver, it will be converted back to pyruvate Lactate will be converted back to pyruvate using the same enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase. This happens in the liver. And when oxygen is present again, hopefully by then, pyruvate is further broken down and oxidized in aerobic respiration. So lactate convert back to pyruvate. Pyruvate continue doing what it's doing, break down into link reaction, Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. However, if there is enough energy already to begin with and there is extra so if there's excess lactate then they will be converted to glycogen so imagine this you are running down the track uh, in the park when it's not mco okay and you're running 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 and you realize that your muscles become a little bit sore and the soreness is actually caused by lactic acid but you know that the lactic acid is also connected to your breathing rate and your heart rate. It all has a, it all makes sense together, right? Um, so let's look at this graph and find out more, right? So when you see a graph, read the axis. The y-axis here is oxygen uptake, dm cubed per minute, and the y-axis here is time. At first you're resting, and then this is when you're exercising, and this is when you recover. Now, oxygen uptake is a measure of metabolic rate, yes. It's also very closely related to how fast you're breathing, right? When you rest, clearly you're not exercising, and therefore the rate of oxygen uptake at resting levels is low. The demand of for oxygen is also low. But during exercise, the oxygen and demand and uptake by cells immediately increases. It doesn't increase over time. It immediately increases to this much at this blue color region right here. However, it takes time for your heart and lungs to unable uh, to meet that demand. Your heart and lungs cannot immediately raise the temperature. Uh, sorry, not temperature. The breathing rate, the heart rate. It cannot immediately be fast. Okay, it will slowly build up, and therefore you can see this smooth curve here, and then reach the oxygen demand. So as a result, you have this oxygen deficit. This oxygen deficit is the volume between the ideal and the real oxygen uptake. So this is how much, this white area is how much oxygen you're taking in, but this blue area is what you need but did not fulfill. So what happens to this area? This area gets fulfilled. So this oxygen demand deficit gets fulfilled by anaerobic respiration. What happens during recovery? Now during recovery, you re you real real blah, blah. So what happens during recovery? Recovery, um, you will realize that your breathing and rates and oxygen uptake is still higher than resting levels, and it sort of slowly slows down. It doesn't suddenly become a flat curve. It doesn't slowly just stop when you exercise. You will still need some time to cool down, right? And it's still higher than resting levels, and this is not a coincidence. This is because. Uh, your body is trying to pay back, so-called pay back the oxygen that 
What does it mean by oxygen depth? So we had anaerobic respiration when, while we exercise, but now we have to breathe in more so that the volume of oxygen uh, required is taken in. And this oxygen can be used to metabolize lactate accumulated during uh, anaerobic respiration, convert it back to pyruvate, and completely oxidize it. Okay? And after complete oxidation, of course, it becomes CO2 and water after exercise. Now, extra oxygen, ex oxygen is also needed for the conversion of lactate to glycogen. It's also um, needed for the reoxygenated hemoglobin of the blood and also to meet the high metabolic rate in organs. So that's why you have this oxygen depth right here. And your body slowly slows down um, to fulfill the oxygen depth. So how do you calculate oxygen depth basically? So we know that oxygen depth is the volume of oxygen that's required to metabolize lactate accumulated. Right, so how do we calculate this volume? Well, easy. Basically, we find out the net oxygen consumed. So whatever we inhale and whatever we exhale, the difference is what we have taken in, right? We measure oxygen consumption or oxygen uptake at rest. So we measure this volume. And then we again measure this volume right after exercise stops. Of course, this is not based on the graph here. This is based on like a real life example. So like you literally measure your oxygen consumption at rest and af right after your exercise stops. So it should be around this point here. This point here. Then you find a difference between those two points. And the extra oxygen consumed right after the exercise stops, that is the oxygen depth. And just to be more accurate, divide it by the mass of organism to get a proportion. And that's how you calculate oxygen depth. I think we'll see some questions as we go along. So that's it for uh, ethanol and lactate pathway. Let's talk about some similarities and differences. So, just to highlight to you, they are both pathways of anaerobic respiration. They both occur when oxygen is absent or very low in concentration. They both occur in a cytoplasm, okay, around the same area where glycolysis is occurring. They both involve glycolysis. Um, and they both produce only two ATP molecules net per glucose molecule and both involve the usage and regeneration of NAD. Okay, so if you want, you can revise and try to recall by pausing this video right here to tell yourself what are the differences between the ethanol and lactate pathway. I'll flesh the answers out in a moment. Okay, so here are the answers. So that's it for this video. I'll see you next video. Bye! Or you know, in labs. Bye!